How and why was radium discovered in an unventilated shed? And in fact, how was radioactivity discovered and named in the first place? What was the world's most important PhD dissertation? Well, it all has to do with a fascinating woman named Marie Sklodowska Curie. Ready for her story? Let's go. Electricity, electricity. Maria Skodowska was born in 1867 in Warsaw, Poland, and was the fifth child of a science and a math school teacher and a school principal. However, Maria's family suffered because they were fiercely patriotic to Poland while it was under the regime of the Russian Empire. In fact, her father lost his job because of his politics. A series of further tragedies followed. Her father lost their savings and bad investments, requiring them to rent to boarders. Then her older sister died of typhus from a border. And then her mother died of tuberculosis. When Maria, who was nicknamed Manya, was 17, she and her sister Bronya made a pact. Manya would work as a governess and earn enough money for Bronya to get an education in Paris. And then Bronya would support Manya in her education later on. The only higher education available to women at the time in Poland was an illegal night school called the Flying University, which had limited effect and, as it was illegal, proffered no degrees. Maria then took a job as a governess, first for a family in Krakow, which she described as sunk in the darkest stupidity, as she felt that she, quote, shouldn't like my worst enemy to live in such a hell. She switched to a different family that seemed like a much better fit. All that changed when the oldest son came home from school and they fell in love and wanted to marry. The parents loved Maria as a governess, but hated her as a future daughter-in-law and forbade the marriage. After much dithering with her feelings, the son decided to heed his parents' wishes. Maria wrote to her cousin complaining, quote, let him go to the devil. She then tried to devote herself to self-study. In October of 1888, she wrote her brother, quote, I'm learning chemistry from a book. You can imagine how little I get out of that. But what can I do as I have no place to make experiments or do practical work? This was to be a lifelong complaint. However, despite her irritation with her lover, she continued to see him. And when his parents found out, they fired her. Despondent, she went home. By March of 1890, when her sister invited her to finally come to Paris to start her studies, she delayed it for months, hoping that the man would change his mind, writing her sister, quote, I have been stupid, I am stupid, and I shall remain stupid all the days of my life. Finally, after receiving a nasty breakup letter, Maria Sklodowska moved to Paris in fall of 1891 to study at the Sorbonne. In France, she renamed herself Marie and lived a monostatic existence, subsiding on so little food that she often fainted. Finally, in 1893, a Polish friend moved heaven and earth to get her a scholarship. With that money to eat and to study, she decided to do some independent research and went looking for a research facility. It was for that reason that she met a French physicist named Pierre Curie. They quickly fell in love and Pierre wanted to get married. But Marie felt she had to go back to Poland saying, quote, Poles have no right to abandon their country. Pierre wrote Marie, it would be a beautiful thing, a thing I dare not hope, if we could spend our life near each other, hypnotized in our dreams. Your dreams for your country, our dream for humanity, our dream for science but we're powerless to change the social order. With science, however, perhaps we can accomplish something. Maybe it was Pierre's love letters, or maybe it was her home country's refusal to let her teach or study at the university, even with degrees in math and physics. But Marie decided to return to Paris, marry Pierre, and attempt to get a PhD. Note at the time, no woman in the world had a PhD in science. In the meanwhile, Marie earned money teaching science to young women and working with industry on the magnetism of metals. She wanted to earn money to pay back the scholarship. To all that was the joyous news that they were expecting a baby. Marie gave birth to Irene Curie in September of 1897. Marie recalled, quote, It became a serious problem how to take care of our little Irene and of our home without giving up my scientific work. 
Such a renunciation would have been very painful to me, and my husband would not even think of it. They had just enough money to hire a servant, and Pierre's father moved in to help with childcare. Marie then looked for a subject for her doctorate. Luckily, just the previous year, 1896, a French physicist named Henri Becquerel had learned that X-rays were created when invisible cathode rays hit glass and made it fluoresce. Now, Becquerel had gotten his doctorate in fluorescence and phosphorescence. Fluorescence glow only when hit with visible or ultraviolet light, and phosphorus glow when the light is removed. Becquerel thus wondered if maybe fluorescence or phosphorescence would produce X-rays. By February 24th, he happily reported that phosphorescent uranium salts would produce invisible rays that would go through paper and could be seen in film. Just two days later, Becquerel made some uranium salts, but the day was cloudy, so he decided to put the sample in a desk drawer. The next two days were also cloudy, and frustrated, he decided to develop the film as a baseline for his experiments, quote, expecting to find the images very weak. Instead, to his complete surprise, quote, the silhouettes appeared with great intensity. He immediately decided that the uranium was making these rays without any input. The very next day, March 2nd, 1896, Becquerel published On the Invisible Rays Emitted by Phosphorescent Bodies where he quite rightly said that his discovery, quote, seems to me quite important and beyond the phenomenon which one could expect to observe. Becquerel then found that the uranium didn't even need to be phosphorescent and therefore called them uranium rays. Becquerel was excited, but the rest of the world was not. Because radiation from uranium has such high energy that the rays go through bones just as well as flesh, so it was useless for medical purposes. However, Marie Sklodowska Curie was interested. She also recalled that 17 years earlier, her husband and his brother had discovered piezoelectricity, the physics property where changing the pressure creates electricity in certain crystals, and that applying electricity to those crystals will cause them to deform. The brothers then used this knowledge to create a sensitive electroscope, or a device that measured very low currents by measuring the pressure on these crystals, which would then tell you the current going through them. Now, Becquerel found that uranium rays could make gases slightly conductive. So Marie decided to use her husband's device to detect radioactivity with electricity. Marie recalled, quote, instead of making these bodies act upon photographic plates, I preferred to determine the intensity of their radiation by measuring the conductivity of air exposed to the action of the rays. In this way, Marie determined that the amount of radiation produced was dependent on the amount of uranium present and nothing else. Now, Becquerel had come to the same conclusion, but with much less formal proof. But then Marie Curie took it to another level. She wondered if maybe the uranium was emitting rays because of something that was happening with the atoms. She then thought that there must be other materials to make these rays, saying years later that, quote, it was scarcely possible that radioactivity, considered as an atomic property, should belong to a certain kind of matter to the exclusion of all other. Marie Curie then collected every known substance and exhaustively studied them on the electroscope. By April of 1898, she found that thallium was about as radioactive as uranium. As there were two substances that displayed this phenomenon, she thought it inappropriate to call them uranium rays and instead called it radioactive, as in radiation active, and the name stuck, although without the dash. While she was studying every material she could get her hands on, she also studied many minerals and ores, which were composed of many elements put together. She was not surprised to find that ores made of uranium and thallium were radioactive. However, she was astonished to find that some uranium ores were significantly more radioactive than pure uranium. Marie Curie, I then made the hypothesis that the ores must contain in a small quantity a substance much more strongly radioactive than either uranium or thorium. This substance could not be one of the known elements because these had already been examined. It must therefore be a new chemical element. 
Pierre was so intrigued that he dropped his research and joined in her studies. For the next several years, they worked side by side, sometimes filling in the different sides of the same notebook. By July of 1898, the Curies published their theory that there must be a new radioactive material that they named polonium after Poland. Marie and Pierre decided to work with an ore pitch blend, which was a uranium ore that was about four times more radioactive than pure uranium. Because they got a ton of it from the Austrian government who wanted to get rid of unwanted mining waste. At the same time, Pierre's university said that the only room they could use to research in was an old abandoned shed that used to be the School of Medicine's old dissection room. Quote, there was no question of obtaining the needed proper apparatus in common use by chemists. We simply had some old pine wood tables with furnaces and gas burners. Yet, Marie recalled years later, quote, it was in this miserable old shed that we passed the best and happiest years of our life. By December, they had found another substance hidden in the ore. And this one they called radium after radiation. Now the race was on to try to isolate these new elements, radium and or polonium. By doing chemical experiments and seeing if the results had higher radiation or lower radiation, they thought it would be easy. Quote, perhaps a few weeks would suffice to solve the problem. Instead, it took almost four years to partially isolate radium. In fact, Marie didn't completely isolate radium until 1910, and she never isolated polonium. In 1902, Marie and Pierre Curie managed to get one-tenth of a gram of radium chloride salt from several tons of ore. The salt turned out to be fascinating. They found it to be a million times more radioactive than uranium. In addition, radium would naturally glow. Marie recalled how she and Pierre enjoyed working at night when, quote, the feebly luminescent silhouettes of the bottles or capsules containing our products look like faint fairy lights. It's terrifying, isn't it? They really had no idea how dangerous radium was. Well over a hundred years later, their notebook is still so radioactive, you're required to wear protective clothing to touch it. Even her cookbooks and furniture are still tainted, and their bodies are buried in lead-lined boxes so that visitors can honor them unharmed. They didn't know it was dangerous, but they immediately knew it produced heat, a lot of heat. Marie found, quote, radium can melt in an hour its weight in ice. Even though the radium was producing this heat continuously, it didn't seem to be changing in shape or weight. What was going on? By 1903, Marie started to think that maybe radioactivity, quote, is due to a transformation in the atom itself. Although if that was true, Marie worried that, quote, we should be forced to abandon the theory of the invariability of atoms, which is the foundation of modern chemistry. On June 25th, 1903, Marie Sklodowska Curie published her findings in a PhD thesis, where the committee told her she had produced, quote, the greatest scientific contribution ever made in a doctoral thesis. But how did radioactivity work? Well, one of the problems with understanding radioactivity in the early 1900s is they had no idea of what was going on inside the atom. Electrons had been discovered in 1897, but nobody had any idea about the existence of the nucleus, let alone that a nucleus could decay. It was actually their discovery of radium that led a boisterous Kiwi to accidentally discover the nucleus while bombarding gold foil with radiation. How Ernest Ern Rutherford discovered we are all almost completely nothing is next time on The Lightning Tamers. Thanks for watching my video. I'm starting a Patreon page, so if you feel like supporting me and these videos, that would be wonderful. I'm gonna include a few extra behind the scenes videos as well as a video every time saying how I'm excited about the next video and why. Also, if you feel like supporting me, but you just don't want to put in any money or you're broke, I totally understand. Also consider joining my mailing list and you can still see my videos a day early. Both my Patreon page and my mailing list links are down below in the comments. Okay, have a great day.